Okay. So thank you, Sandy. And thanks to WISE for hosting this talk and especially to Monica for inviting me. Welcome to all of you and thanks for joining in. So I'm going to show some of my work, mostly photography, a little bit about drawing, illustration, and writing, but it's going to be in the context of mentors and teachers uh, that I've had over the years that have, have most influenced my work. I also just want to give a shout out to some very fine artists who are good friends of mine that have also been really helpful and supportive and inspiring. So Colleen, Pippi, Vivian, Kate, Deb, Nasser, and Gary, thanks to you, but they're not going to be part of this presentation. So my hope is that if you're an aspiring artist, that you'll find something useful or inspiring in the talk. And if you don't think of yourself of an artist, um, I'm hoping maybe I can help convince you that you um, can and should become one. So this is the list of the topics and the mentors that I'm going to talk about. And then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Uh, and this is the quote. So it's from Yogi Berra. And if you don't know where you were going, you'll end up someplace else. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes that's desirable, but it should be a conscious decision. But the mentors and teachers that I've had over the years have have been greatly helpful uh, in sort of figuring out where I actually want to go. So my introduction to photography was uh, when I was in high school, my dad was an amateur photographer and had a dark room down in the basement. And it was the first time I ever saw really the magic of an image appearing on a blank sheet of paper in the developer. And it's sort of, I mean, I like digital, you sort of can't avoid it, but it's, it's too bad that most people don't get to see that anymore. It's really quite magical. So this is one of the first images that I ever took. Um, I was probably 20 or 21 years old. I was renting a, a basement apartment in Arlington, Virginia, and working as a key punch operator to make money to pay for school. I got up early one morning turned around, looked back, and there was this incredible scene with the light coming through the Venetian blinds and the curtains and on, the, um, on my bed. And there's a great quote from a photographer, Harold Feinstein, said, when your jaw drops, click the shutter. And that was certainly the case uh, in this instance. I immediately grabbed my camera and took this picture. And so I was, I've always been interested in photography. In my, my sophomore year in college, I really went back and forth whether to, to major in, to pursue photography or computer science. And I chose computer science and it was, a, it was a good decision and I had a wonderful career, but there's always been sort of this nagging question of, well, what if? I certainly, you know, my life would have been completely different, but you're always sort of wondering, well, what if? But I, I always had a camera, I continued to take pictures the whole time. But when I retired, 10 years ago is when I, I got serious about photography again and started doing something, trying to do something every day. One of the, the very earliest influences was this book. And my good friend, who's also a wonderful artist, Colleen, loaned me her copy. Uh, and it's by an author named Ted Orland, who co-authored Art and Fear, which is a much more famous book. But this book really changed my life. It's, like you said, how artists find their way in an uncertain world. And so I'm going to refer to it a, a, a lot. He printed it with very wide margins. And so my copy is just full of notes and stars and dog ears. So this is one of my favorite quotes from the book. Just one more genius or superstar would not do as much to make this world a better place as would thousands and thousands of people across the country quietly making art on a daily basis. The need for more art in the community is not nearly so great as the need for more artists in the community. And he sort of argues against this fallacy that art only comes from artists with a capital A, you know, um, artists that are backed by publishers and music labels and galleries and PR departments that have sort of hijacked, you know, the words art and artists. There's wonderful art being created by local artists and he also makes the point that if you want local artists in your community, you need to support local artists. This inspired me because I realized that I could be a, an, an artist with a little a, that it's still art and you're still an artist, but it can be with a little a. 
So he also makes a, a, a pretty compelling case that everyone should learn how to draw, write, and take pictures. And part of his argument is that drawing helps you look at things more closely, not only lines, shapes, textures, colors, and perspective, but also the essence, the, the nests of things, roseness and mountainness. Writing helps you to think more clearly, and photography helps you more thoughtfully observe the world around you. And I really took this to heart. I had been taking pictures for most of my life, but had never uh, really tried to write. And I think my last drawing class was probably in elementary school. So one of the first things I did was a portfolio review, a critique with Catherine French, who at the time was the director of the Danforth Museum of Art. And this was a service they offered to their members. And I came away from this, this review with, with a whole page of notes, suggestions on to take classes, go to museums and galleries, present work at portfolio reviews, read the diaries of Edward Weston and Ansel Adams. But at the time, I had really only been serious about photography for about a year. And I just had lots of images of things that, quote, that caught my eye. And so I had taken a couple of dozen prints and Catherine had lots of really good feedback and suggestions, but sort of towards the end of the work, into the session rather, she said, you seem to like hands. And I realized that I had three images of people's hands in these 24 prints, and then I had another three at home. And so I, I wanted at that time, rather than just having lots of different images, which I you know, which was fine, but I wanted to start creating a body of work with a common theme, with sort of a common thread, uh, images that looked like they had been, had been created by one person. So this is the artist statement for the Hands series, and this was, sort of describes what I am trying to do. So the images in this series are portraits of hands of people doing things they care about, working, creating, playing, at one level, I'm trying to show the amazing qualities of hands, texture, color, gesture, and form. I'm also trying to give a sense of what it might be like to stand beside the person, to imagine what they look like, what they sound like, and maybe even what they're thinking. This is, I, I think, seven or eight images from my hands series. This was the first one I took. It was two gentlemen playing Chinese chess in, uh, in New York. This is a, a woman who's a potter. She has a studio in an old toothbrush factory in Western Massachusetts. This is one of the vendors from um, Haymarket in Boston. This is a woman making a, a sweet water basket. This is fairly famous kind of basket that African-Americans make in Charleston, South Carolina. This is a, a guy plastering a wall. It was actually from Havana, Cuba. And this is a mother putting makeup on her daughter for a festival also in Cuba. So my first real workshop that I took was with Jay Maisel. And this is a, um, the poster for a documentary that they did about Jay. Uh, he's a fairly famous photographer but he's, he's probably better known for this building. It's a, a, was a, it's a six story building in the Bowery. It was a bank. He bought it in, um, for $102,000 in 1965 and sold it for $55 million in 2015. And so I had the good fortune of uh, taking the workshop in this building and it, is, it was jammed full, every floor, every room with his stuff. So I mean, some of it was photographic, but he just collected stuff. It was, it was unbelievable. So Jay um, taught workshops for years and years and years. I, I, I think he has stopped. He was 82 when I, when I took it. The workshop, and he's sort of notorious for being a, a very, very harsh critic and unconditionally supportive. So after a week, I came out sort of my head spinning, but at least some idea of what I needed to do to continue. So this is a quote from Jay. Uh, you will in time see and show others, not just the superficial, but the details, the meanings and the implications of all that you look at. The wetness, reflectivity and power of water, 
the subtlety of clouds, the texture of the bark of a tree, the delightful surface of a finished piece of wood, the smoothness of a baby, the rough, ragged face of the aged, or the aerial perspective of diminishing clarity in a series of mountains. So when I was putting uh, this talk together, I realized that even though I had not consciously gone out and created images for these different subjects, there actually are seven of them, that I had images that I, I quite liked for all seven of them. So I'm going to show you seven slides that are in Jay's list here. So the first one he talks about is the wetness, reflectivity, and power of water. And these eight images are from a series that I was the first one, the first project where I kept going back to the same place over and over again. Uh, there was a small aqueduct in Southborough, Massachusetts, and the water comes over a dam into a pool about the size of a large living room and then under a bridge, which is under a, a road. These are all just close up shots of the, of the surface of the water and reflections. And I, I literally took thousands of pictures. I, I don't know probably have several hundred on my website, but I kept going as long as I kept getting new images. But every time it depended on the time of day, the season, whether the sun was bright, whether it was cloudy, whether there was wind, which direction the wind was from. And so all of these images and, and hundreds more really just came from the same small section of, of this aqueduct. So Jay's second subject, he talks about the subtlety of clouds. And this is certainly the laziest project I ever did. I was living, living in Santa Fe for a while. And there was this one week where these unbelievable clouds just rolled through day after day after day. And uh, at a friend's house, I literally just laid in this chase lounge with my camera. And in the morning, I would go out and a cup of coffee and just lay in this chase lounge and take pictures. And then late in the day, I'd go out with a glass of wine and take more pictures. And again, ended up with hundreds and hundreds. And this is just a, a selection of, of some of them, these unbelievable clouds rolling through. Jay's third item is the texture of the bark of the tree. And I had no idea what this was going to turn into. I was walking around Tower Hill Botanical Garden one day and noticed a tree that had sort of an interesting bark. So I took a close up photo of it, sort of just the, the abstract, the pattern, the, the, the texture. And then I found another tree there and then another tree there. And then it just completely got out of hand. So for years, Every place that I've been, I've looked for arboretums and botanical gardens. This is just a selection of 20 of these close-ups of tree bark. I think I have over 400 on my website now. This has turned into a, a lifelong project. His fourth item was the delightful surface of a finished piece of wood. This one just tickles me. It, the keyhole looks like a, an eye with the, someone wearing a monocle. This was from up in, in um, near Wells, Maine. The fifth one was the smoothness of a baby. This was an image I took at the Wampanoag powwow out on the Cape. The sixth was the rough, ragged face of the aged. This was a gentleman, again, in Havana, Cuba. I was on a dawn patrol walk just before sunrise. Saw him sitting on a wall right next to the ocean, kind of held up my camera. And he nodded, and so I took his picture. And the seventh and last subject that Jay talked about was the aerial perspective of diminishing clarity in a series of mountains. And this was taken before sunrise in Death Valley, California. So the, the next mentor I want to talk about is Arthur Meyerson, who is actually a, a protege of Jay Maisel, and I met him at Jay's workshop. This is the cover of his first book, uh, and the title, The Color of Light, is really reflective. That's his... his Arthur was a commercial photographer, but his personal work is really about color and light. I did a six month mentorship with him, also a workshop uh, in Santa Fe. And then the trip to Cuba was with, with Arthur in a group. He was really the one that taught me how to take better pictures. This is a quote from another actually fairly famous photographer, Sam Abel, who's a National Geographic photographer, talking about Arthur and his work. So to his strong, sure scene, Arthur adds himself. An Arthur Meyerson photograph 
is emotionally warm and involving, like Arthur. Brought to Arthur's work by its strength of scene, we stay with it for its subtlety of feeling. Uh, and it's very too, true. Uh, Arthur's images are visually very, very powerful, but it's 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 really the Arthur and, and Arthur's emotional sense that, that what keeps you looking at them. So what I've got now are, are a few of the slides uh, that I took on the trip to Cuba, sort of with an emphasis on color and light. The next mentor I want to talk about is Karen Rosenthal. I took actually three photography workshops and a print critique with Karen. And this is a quote from her website. My desire to photograph nudes was born of the water of a passion for being in and meditating upon still waters. I felt that water, the source of all life, should display an equivalent density to flesh, invoking a cauldron of creation and a visceral visual connection between body and nature. Karen also curated an exhibition at the Griffin Museum of Photography. Uh, it was titled 37 Photographers, One Model. We actually all called it the Jim Show because the one model uh, is a guy named Jim Banta. And so the whole show was Karen and 36 of the people that had taken her workshops, all images of this same Jim. The workshops uh, that I, I took with Karen sort of resulting in this series that I call Lost Dreams, which is, is my expression of, of nudes in nature. So this is, this is Jim. And I actually did ask him to swim out there and dive off those rocks. But after, this was up in Vermont, and it was a warm day in August, but the water was really cold. So after three dives, he had really had enough. Came out literally shaking and with blue lips. Jim, however, is, is fearless. I did not ask him to climb up the side of this barn. That was his idea. This is another image from a workshop up in Vermont. Karen came by when I was working on this image and suggested that I, I in post-processing, make the glass crackle. I have no idea what crackle meant, but I, I think I got close. And these last images are from the workshop out on the Cape. Uh, and actually one of the models drew those rings around them. So the next mentor I wanna talk about is Nick Johnson. Nick is a, a wonderful photographer. He also taught for years and years at the New England School of Photography at NISOP. And uh, Nick and his wife, Kelly, run Gallery 7 with, uh, in Maynard, uh, which is both an art gallery and a framing shop. So I worked on and off with Nick for two and a half years. And sometimes we would just sit and talk. And sometimes we would go down the basement where they had the framing shop and these huge tables and I would take a bunch of prints and we would just slide them around and sort of do selection and sequencing. But there are two things in particular I wanna talk about. One is I came up with my sort of big picture overall artist statement. And the other is a project that I did called the Marlboro Foundry. So this doesn't describe all of my work but it really describes the work that I care about the most. So much of my work focuses on the miracle of daily life, how we make our way in the world safely and sanely. Remarkably, we often do so with kindness, humor, creativity, wisdom, friendship, and teamwork. 
I want to better understand the unique worlds that people create for themselves to explore the paths they follow or trails they blaze, to record the footprints and artifacts they leave behind. I wonder if they like their job, where they're going, who cares if they're sick, what makes them happy, is their family safe, what do they regret, and what do they show and hide? So this is some of the images from the Marlboro Foundry series. I spent 10 weeks photographing the workers and their environment, focus on the environment, the skill, pride, focus, and hard work, the dust and steam illuminated by the morning light, the molten aluminum flowing like a demon into molds that resemble medieval torture devices, the gloves that have permanently assumed the shape of the owner's hands, the tools and materials that look the same 100 years ago and will look the same 100 years from now. This is an aluminum foundry and they do two types of castings. One is called sand and the other is permanent mold and you'll see examples of both. So this is the inside um, of the foundry building, just on the other side of that wall that you saw with all the windows. This is one of the guys pouring aluminum into a permanent cast mold. And when I said they looked like medieval torture instrument instruments, this is what I was talking about. This is a guy with a a jackhammer breaking apart the sand from a sand casting. This is actually part of a, a portable MRI device. He's sandblasting the base for a clock that's going to go to the town of Medfield. This is heating two uh, of these heavy iron cauldrons that they're going to put aluminum into to pour into a mold. This is a guy with a ladle pulling aluminum out of a furnace, and this is pouring into another permanent mold. So the next mentor I want to talk about is uh, Arno uh, Minkinen. He's also an a incredible photographer and teaches at UMass Lowell. And this is, is a quote from an, a, a story that he tells, actually an article he wrote called Stay on the Bus. And it's really an art, it's an allegory for the journey of an artist. And so in this story, imagine um, that you're at the, the bus station in, in central Helsinki, Arnold's from Finland, and you get on the bus and you ride for a while, you're still in the city, it's kind of crowded, but you see a stop that looks interesting. So you get off the bus, you walk around, take some pictures, it's sort of nice, but you realize that really all the pictures look like ones that, that Jay Maisel took. And so you get back on the bus, you ride some more, and now it's starting to, um, to thin out a little bit, but you're still in, this, in the city. And so you see a stop that looks interested. And so you decide, you'll hop off, take some more pictures, but this is really Arthur's stop. And you realize that all the work that you create in looks like Arthur's. And so you get back on the bus. And so you ride and ride and ride. And now it's really, you're getting pretty far out of the city. It's pretty sparse. There aren't many people around, but you see the stop and it looks uh, sort of interesting. So you get off and you start taking pictures and it, you're just home. You just love this place. And nobody has claimed this stop yet. And so you, you make it your own. And it's really is what the, the journey, the path feels like, if you will. So I, I did a workshop with Arno up in Maine the series came out of the workshop called Strange As It Seems. So I'm gonna read just a little bit of the, um, the artist statement for this series. The word strange has been rattling around my head for a while. A Google search to find strange as unusual or surprising in a way that is unsettling or hard to understand. The world is full of things that are unusual or surprising, but it's the unsettling or hard to understand twist that makes things strange, especially interesting. It inhabits the twilight zone between straightforward and incomprehensible. Mostly we like strange things, while straightforward can be dull and incomprehensible can be tiresome, 
For me, strange is often like a little puzzle and solving puzzles is fun. So this is the first image I took. I was actually laying on the ground, uh, looking up, there's a glass door and you can see um, on the other side of the door, these stairs uh, going up to an apartment and you can see the door to the apartment is the white rectangle in the sky but everything else is reflected from behind me. So the clouds, the sky, the building is behind me. And this was early in the morning. And while I was laying there, this woman came up behind me and said a little suspiciously, what are you doing? And so I described the scene and she slow, kind of shook her head, slowly backed away and muttered artists under her breath. <laughs> so. This was sort of the first image that started the Strange As It Seems series. This is an interior of a um, restaurant early in the morning. This was a shop that was being renovated. This is a, a garage from Savannah, Georgia. This is uh, taken off the BU Bridge uh, during the uh, head of the Charles Regatta. And at the bottom, that's actually the stern of the skull shell, if you will. This is a um, battered lobster trap from near Wells, Maine. And this is actually uh, me and my kayak going under a bridge nearby the, the under the, on the river, um, the Aspet River, which is right near my house. So I, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, another famous photographer who I've not met, uh, Elliot Erwitt, who as you see was um, sort of the, the origin for another series that I did. So this is a, one of my favorite quotes from Elliot Erwitt. Photography is an art of observation. It has little to do with the things you see and everything to do with the way you see them. This is one of my favorite Elliot Erwitt photographs. If you haven't figured it out yet, the two legs on the left are from a very large dog, Great Dane or something. But I've always loved this image. It just tickles me. But it, it got me thinking like, what, what does the world look like if you're really small, if you're like this tiny little dog on the right? So one night I was walking to a, a subway and there was this long tunnel and off to the left, uh, you can't see it, but there was a trash bin and it was overflowing. So there was a bunch of food wrappers and things on the left. And I started thinking, well, because it, it's very bright and there were lots of people, but would a mouse come out and sort of eat some of the food there? Uh, would it be courageous enough or hungry enough? But then it got me thinking, well, what is a mouse's life like at night? Like what, what is, does it find interesting? What's dangerous? What's pleasant? Uh, what's safe, what's confusing. And so this was the beginning of a series that's titled What the Night Mouse Saw. And so essentially I'm trying to put myself in a mouse's shoes, if you will, you know, both physically and emotionally, physically, because I just, I set my camera right on the ground. So they're, they're always from ground level. And, you know, within a, a couple of minutes, this, um, this boy came riding his scooter out of the, um, tunnel to the subway. So this was the first image in the um, What the Night Mouse Saw series. So here's a few more. This is um, a strip club actually in Croatia. This was a, a backyard. You'll notice there's a cat at the top of the stairs. I also just like all the white laundry on the left. These are the ducklings in um, Boston Common Garden. I mean in Garden. So it's just a grate on a street in Cambridge. Halloween out in Western Mass. This was a, a subway station in Washington, DC. This was a, a children's a playground in New York City. And so I have lots and lots of these images, but a few years ago, I decided to take some of them and, and create this book for children. So I selected um, about 35 images that I thought would be particularly interesting to children. So this, the book is titled The Nighttime Adventures of Elliot the Mouse. And this is the Elliot that I, I drew for the book. 
And sort of the audience was children, but pre-readers, uh, three years, three to six years old, say. And the goal was, I mean, I want to make the images interesting, but was to sort of encourage them to think of how the world might look through the eyes of a mouse. Again, what's interesting, what's scary, what would be confusing, but even broader, even more so, how the world might look and feel through the eyes, you know, from someone of a different culture, you know, putting themselves in someone else's shoes. So I, I want to talk just briefly about drawing. I, I spend lots more time on photography, but as I mentioned earlier, one of Ted's suggestions was to learn how to draw. So I took some classes from a wonderful artist um, and teacher named Ron Krauk. These were at Danforth. And I'm not going to go through all these. These are, are three post-its he had up on the board when we were at the class. But I, but I do want to make the point that drawing is, is a very learnable subject. It's very teachable. So a lot of these techniques, I mean, drawing bigger shapes first, looking at negative space, looking at perspective, it's all very, very learnable, teachable. Most of the drawing that I do, though, is either for book illustration or for printmaking. This is the cover that I did for my second book, which is called Hyperbole World. And some, I'm going to read a brief note, which is actually on the back cover. So visually, Hyperbole World is a collection of photographs showing mom and pop shops named Something World, where something is a noun like bagel, crocodile, condom, magic, or spandex. The images, I hope, are interesting, but ultimately the goal of this book is to showcase the pride, hope, gumption, imagination, humor, pluck, and okay, maybe a little hubris of the owners. This was the image that started it. So my wife and I were driving back from Acadia National Park and passing through Waldoboro, Maine, very small town, and just saw this sign for Dog Eat Dog World. And it, it sort of amused us. And we were still talking about it and we about a mile away. And she said, you know, we really should go back and take a picture of that sign. So we did. And then when I got home and put up on my large monitor, I realized there were all these little odd quirky details like that the sign is hanging from a torpedo in fact you can see that the sign ripped off once and they drilled new holes and rehung it so they they really want this hanging from the torpedo i'm not sure what worldly hot dogs are it's a little odd selling hot dogs and lobster rolls but it was maine but i love that they had the globe of the time behind the hot dog but especially that they called it world it's just i wish i could be a fly on the wall when their friends or family were sitting around trying to come up with a, a name for, you know, essentially a food truck on the side of the road. Could have gone with, you know, shack or truck or house or something, but, but they went with world. Well, once we sort of realized this, we, we then just kept finding them everywhere. So here's a few more images from the Hyperbole World series. So this is Spandex World. It's in New York, right near Penn Station. This is Concrete World, lawn figures from Rustburg, Virginia. This is Shooter's World from Phoenix, Arizona. Notice the, the crosshairs in the O in Shooter's. This was Hubcap World, which is a great find. This was in Oklahoma City. Froyo World was actually from Great Barrington, Western Massachusetts, and it's a little hard to see, but, but the guy on the bicycle is actually wearing a pink and white boa. Salad World is from Portland, Oregon. I didn't eat there. I want to talk a little bit about writing now, which was the third piece of, of Ted Orland's suggestion. So about six or seven years ago, I started writing a blog. And it was, it was a, there was a short essay paired with a photo. And I had the great good fortune of finding an editor, my friend Kate, who had been a writer and an editor for magazines. Uh, and so literally every word, every comma, every thought in this book uh, was, was helped shape by my, my friend Kate. So the, the goal was to keep the essays, I wanted them to be short, interesting, easy to read, maybe useful or humorous would be great. And they really cover 
photography, of course, but even art in general and the creative process. So one of the things I, I learned is that this is really hard. Even these short little essays would often take me a week in eight or 10 or 12 revisions. And I learned to appreciate one of my favorite authors is uh, E.L. Doctorow. And he wrote, writing is easy, thinking clearly is hard, which is, is certainly true. So a couple of years ago, I, I created this book called This Is Not a Sawtooth Hanger. And I, I chose my, my 56 favorites of these essays and photo pairs. And it's in four chapters. There's one on the photograph, one on the viewer, one on the photographer, and one on art in general. And I wrote it really for artists, you know, like me that haven't found their voice, who you know what they know what they like, but aren't entirely sure why or how best to express it. Um, what are you trying to say? Does the work actually say that? If not, how come? And why are you showing it to me? Um, so this is just a sample page. So there was in the book, there's always an essay on the left and an image on the right. This is one I, I did a series of these on, is it art? Uh, there's a, some questions, so checklist from Henry James. So this has been uh, my, my main um, pandemic project was trying to create some resources for our teachers that they could use for remote online learning. So I recorded all 56 of the essays from the book and then I created video versions. So there was the audio and the image together and uploaded all those to YouTube and then created lesson plans for each one where each plan has the goal and activity, what materials are needed and uh, eight or 10 or 12 uh, suggestions or questions for assessment and reflection. And some of them are focused more specific to photography, but, but really most of them could, are equally applicable to other visual arts. And so all of the lesson plans and videos and the essays and everything are online and freely available. So this is, this is my summary of my, my lobbying for mentors and teachers and sort of what I looked for and what I found particularly valuable uh, was like Jay Maisel, a harsh critic with unconditional support. You really don't need more cheerleaders. You have family and friends for that. <laughs> it's helpful if you can find someone who is both a teacher and a practitioner. So whether it's photography or drawing or writing or pottery or printmaking or watercolors or whatever, if they both teach and are practicing artists, that's a plus. I suppose I could have come up with an artist statement myself. It seems, I don't know, unlikely. So um, in the, coming up with an artist statement, just a little clearer understanding of, of big picture, what you're trying to do can be really helpful. And just sort of pressing you on what are you trying to do? Did it work or not? Why does it matter? Why are you showing this to me? more for ph photography, but also this whole selection and sequencing issue where you're trying to put together a body of work, suggestions for future work. And then also, you know, it can be helpful for networking or promotion or getting work into exhibitions, but that, that's sort of up to, up to you. And so this is my um, unsolicited, but I think very good advice. So join WISE and take a class, get Ted Orland's book, The View from the Studio Door. Uh, draw, write, and take pictures, find a mentor, and support local artists. And so now I could do questions, big questions, little questions, medium size. I'm gonna stop sharing, but this is this is my website and my Instagram handle and my email. Okay, we we've had uh, several questions in the chat during the presentation and I'll, I'll read those or ask people to read those. But after that, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. Uh, Catherine Hunter, do you want to um, ask your question about Photoshop? Yes, hi, thank you. I was just curious to know the extent to which you use Photoshop. Do you enhance colors? Do you play around with shadows? Do you do a lot of editing? Because I'm personally interested in the number of people who do rely upon Photoshop and it's harder to find photographers who use just what they photograph. Well, two things. One is I don't use any of the Adobe products. So I don't use Photoshop or Lightroom. There's a company in England called Serif 
and they make three products. They're called Affinity Photo, Affinity Designer, and Affinity Publisher. And they're for photo editing, for illustration, and for publishing. So that's what I use for my books. To actually answer your question, very little. My goal is to, is to do very little uh, post-processing. One is, it's just so boring, but also sort of forces me to pay more attention when I'm actually taking the image. One of the things, I always use a monopod and I've suggested it to a hundred people and no one else has ever <laughs> accepted my suggestion, but it slows me down and it forces me to sort of really look at the image. One of the Jay Maisel way back to the beginning said, just because we're photographers, we're still responsible for every square millimeter of what's in the image. Like if you wouldn't have painted it that way, you shouldn't photograph it that way. So I try to spend more time taking the picture and as little as possible post-processing. What is the monopod? Oh, it's like a tripod, but it's just one leg. Oh. So, and it collapses. Amazon, they're about $25. Amazon's got one and they're really fast. They're, they're lightweight. So, yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. That's sure. great. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robin Cutler, uh, you want to ask your question about camera? I'm curious as to what you use for equipment. Uh, we all have our iPhones that take amazing pictures, but I have a sense that you use maybe that or other pieces of equipment. Very little iPhone. I have a, um, a Nikon uh, what's called their DX series. It's a digital camera and I have an 18 to 135 millimeter zoom lens and that's it. But for example, it lets me do, I, I do a lot of street photography. For example, you remember, remember the pink car from the Cuba series. So that camera will take like seven shots a second. So I'm, I'm often with my monopod just going click, 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 which you can't do with a phone camera. So that's it, but that's all I use. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Todd, you have a question about technique using photographs that combine black and white and color. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk, Doug. And for those who've not visited his uh, website, I urge you to, uh, really do so. It is uh, really, really remarkable. My question was, what technique do you use uh, when you combine color and black and white? In the um, Serif Affinity photo, the software that I use, it supports what are called layers like Photoshop does. And so I don't do a lot of this, but, but you can take, you know, two different images. Sorry, but for example, I, I um, created a bunch of fake movie posters with my brother-in-law's face on movie posters, right? So you basically take two images and lay them on top of each other, and then you can do whatever you want to them. You can convert one to black and white, you can mask stuff out. So it's, it's similar to Photoshop, just multiple layers, and then each layer you can do whatever you want to it. Okay, um, Bob has a question. I went to a birthday party uh, for my cousin on Saturday. And, um, you know, it was a Zoom session for about maybe a dozen people in the household. And um, my cousin was there uh, taking photographs of, of the grandparents, the, the, the parents and the children. And he showed the results of a slideshow the next day and they were extraordinary, nice photos. He made them black and white, but it looks of children and elderly people. And I was just very impressed. So I, I, I asked him, how many photos did you take to get those high quality photos. And he said about 500. <laughs> and what he does is he took a lot of photos, but he, as you mentioned, he uses burst mode. Yeah. So besides picking the photos he likes, each photo has about maybe eight or 10 frames. And he has to pick the frame that, uh, uh, you know, that has that best expression. And he said it took him about six, he does a lot of cropping also. Uh, yeah. It took him about six hours. Uh, he, he uses light speed. Uh, it's a lot of work, but the yeah. results were extraordinary. Yeah, especially under difficult conditions, the Marlboro Foundry series, very dark in there. And so I didn't want to use a tripod because I was trying to stay out of the way because there were all these guys, you know, moving around with ladles full of molten aluminum. So I just had my little monopod and tried to stay out of the way, but 
I would often rip off seven shots and six of them would just be blurry because of motion. So. Jill has a question. There are two questions actually, Jonathan and I have. One is about how those, the photography that you're um, doing on site, what technique you were using with lighting. I know New England School of Photography, I took some classes there and so did Jonathan and they taught a lot about metering. And I'm just wondering about some of the lighting techniques that you used. Uh, this is easy, none. I don't have any lights. I put my camera on general, you figure out the exposure. Um, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Do you think there's still a place for film photography within contemporary art right now? I do, I do. I, I like it and in fact, one of my winter projects is a, a printmaking technique. It's like the old platinum palladium. It's, it's, there's a newer version of it called zeotype. And so I have 1500 black and white negatives from back in the early seventies that I've started scanning and I'm planning on doing some zeotype prints with those. But yeah, I just, I don't know. It's, this is a lot of work and it's a lot of time and just to have it end up as a bunch of bits you know, out in some Google so server or somewhere seems incomplete. It's not very satisfying. So I, you know, I like paper. I like books. I like seeing things. So yeah, I do. And it, it's it's sort of like record players. There's really a a renaissance in you know what they call alternative techniques, but film and cyanotype and and all of that. So yeah. You can make a beautiful exhibit just out of the textures that you photographed alone. Oh, yes. And yeah. It's just really stunning, really beautiful yeah. work. Yeah, thanks. So uh, to wrap us up, we have two more questions, one from Lydia and then Jim Ballard. So Lydia. How can you better train the naked eye so that we don't so easily slide to all these different photo editing apps? Yeah, that's a really good question. I actually wrote an essay about how I see, but I don't know that it really would make sense to anyone. There, the, the eye is, is drawn to faces and words and high contrast and bright colors. I can give you a couple of, like at the very first workshop that, that Jay Maisel, um, I, that I took, he said, be careful of the edges, the edges and the corners. The stuff in the middle is fine. That's what you're sort of paying attention to. But before you take the picture, and this is one of the reasons I use the monopod because it gives me time to do this, is look at what's in the corners and the edges. I, I remember when I was a, a in college, I, I photographed the wedding of my roommate and I had this beautiful photo of the two of them outside the um, chapel kissing, you know, with the sun setting behind them. And there was a big telephone pole growing right out of her nose. And so that's always been really helpful is to just before you sort of click the shutter, just take a quick scan around the edges. I don't know, I, I, I also, I really do try to follow Jay's advice of I'm responsible for everything in the image. And so if there's time, uh, it's one of the reasons, it's the main reason I use a zoom lens. So I can, I can always move closer, farther, I can get higher, lower, I can move to the left, the right, I can zoom in, I can zoom out. So I, I have a lot of control over what actually in, ends up in the image. And so if you ever actually see me out shooting, I look a little bit like a nut because I'm constantly bobbing up and down the left and right and moving forward and back and zooming in and out. But I, I remember hearing also like it, when you first start, you see the mistakes like on the monitor, right? Like way too late. And then over time, you'll sort of see the mistakes when you look through the viewfinder. And then eventually you kind of see the potential mistakes before you even pick up your camera. And so you're already kind of framing it, but especially when you're looking through the viewfinder, you need to kind of train yourself to see it as the final print. So I don't know, I don't know if that helps, but those are sort of the most practical ones I can think of. So Jim Ballard, last question. 
Okay, it better be a good one. My question is kind of a mundane one. You've said in the past that you don't shoot all that many photos, uh, but you've owned up today to uh, laying on a chase lounge and, and taking thousands of pictures of clouds. And I know you've taken a lot of pictures of the water down at the end of my block here, that waterfall. Right. How do you, when do you decide how many photos to take? Um, what, what motivates that kind of decision? Yeah, well if, well, if I said I don't take many, that was a misstatement. I don't do much post-processing. Um, I don't fiddle with them much. But no, the, all of those, the foundry project was 3,500. The trees have been thousands. So especially when I'm doing street photography and people are moving, I, again, I'll put it on burst mode and take, okay. you know, just rip off seven shots in two seconds and then go back and, and pick the one that doesn't have a telephone pole growing out of somebody's nose. Right. So I take a lot and then I delete, you know, 98% of them. I see. I see. Some of them look very waited for and deliberate, like the uh, the. I think there was a Cuban fellow sitting or in the morning. He had a beautiful uh, old face, and right. my guess is you didn't take many shots of of him. Is that true? Or? No, no, because he wasn't moving. But th there is a technique. It's called find the stage and wait for the actors. I don't know if you remember. There was another shot from Cuba, and the woman was walking in front of me. Um, with the, the yellow and blue and pink top and holding the pink mug. So I had actually sat down on a doorstep because the building across the street was yellow and pink and blue. And so I was waiting for somebody to sort of walk by, a, you know, a, a star, my actor to walk by. And then she just came out of nowhere and walked right by me with the, the mug. And so that was one also where I, I couldn't control it. So I just kind of set up my camera and as she walked by, I just went to right. You know, took off seven shots and one of them came out. That's all the time we have today. And I want to thank Doug so much for this presentation and wish everybody a happy holiday season.